Welcome, everyone. Um, really nice to see you all here today. We're very excited to be chatting with Cordelia. Um, so I'll briefly introduce Cordelia first, and then we'll jump right in. Um, so uh, Cordelia has a doctorate in computer science from the Institut National Polytechnique de Grenoble, um, and her doctoral thesis on local gray value invariance for image matching and retrieval received the best thesis award in 1996. She received the habilitation degree in 2001 for her thesis entitled From Image Matching to Learning Visual Models. She then did a postdoc in the University of Oxford in the Robotics Research Group of Oxford University. Um, and since 1997, she has held a permanent research position at INRIA, where she is a research director. She is also the author of over 100 technical publications. She has been an associate editor for IEEE PAMI between 2001 and 2005, and for IJCV between 2004 and 2012, editor-in-chief for IJCV between 2013 and present, a program chair for CVPR 2005 and ECCV 2012, as well as a general chair of, of CVPR 2015. In 2006, 2014, and 2016, she was awarded the Longet Higgins Prize for fundamental contributions in computer vision that have withstood the test of time. She is also a fellow of IEEE and was also awarded an ERC advanced grant in 2013 the Humboldt Research Award in 2015, and the INRIA and French Academy of Science Grand Prix in 2016. She was also elected to the German National, German National Academy of Sciences in 2017. And in 2018, she received the Kendrick Prize for Fundamental Contributions in Computer Vision that have withstood the test of time. And since 2018, we've been lucky enough that she has a joint appointment with Google Research. Um, so welcome, Cordelia. Very this is a very impressive bio. We're very happy to be chatting with you today. Yeah, thank you very much for this very nice introduction and thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Um, so I'd like to remind everyone um, that they can also ask questions. Um, and one way that you can do this is by, yes, exactly. Thank you, Utku. That's the link for the Dory. Um, if you're dying to ask, you can also raise your hand and ask. Um, um, so let's get started. Um, so, Cordelia, at which point did you know that you wanted to be a computer scientist? Um, how early did you did you know that that was the case? And what made you initially get into research and computer vision more specifically? Yeah. So basically, I was after high school. I was I liked I would like math a lot, and so basically, given that I like math a lot. I was kind of thinking of either doing applied maths or computer science and then basically by talking to people they recommended me to do computer science because there was more jobs available right so that was kind of the main thing and so basically then I did the computer science normal courses and then for my master's thesis I worked in visual recognition and robotics so my first project was actually detecting objects for robot navi navigation and that's kind of when I got into research so I found it really fascinating how difficult it was to get a computer understand the visual world right at the time it was kind of 20 or 40 years back there nothing worked and basically even like detecting simple objects was super hard and I felt like it was a super interesting problem to see how to improve actually this way of understanding the visual world and to understand why the computer couldn't do the same things as a human can do right for us it's super simple and for a computer it was super hard and that's when I decided to do a PhD and then from there on I stayed in research yeah so basically chasing things that are very hard but interesting that that sounds like a good recipe um yeah and look how far we've come since then um so in fact one thing I was very impressed by when reading your bio is the the number of test of time awards. Um, I'm wondering if you would be willing to say a few words about um, those works that won the test of time awards. Yeah, sure. So the first test of time awards, so the test of time awards, they always awarded ten years later, right? So that was like for the work which was published in. 96 so that was actually the work which i did during my phd and it was on 
visual recognition based on local features. So at the time, most of the works, they used actually geometric invariants. So they first extracted edges and contours and then used those for recognition. And so the approach we introduced was to use local features to recognize objects. And it was the first time or one of the first times where it was possible to recognize real objects in larger collections of images. So this was the first test of time. And then the second test of time award, that was actually work which I did jointly with my first PhD student. And so the work was like a follow-up basically where we kind of investigated what was like the, the blocking points of this approach, right? So it was an evaluation study on how to design better local features and or how to detect them, where to detect them, and how they would impact the performance. And it was actually, one of the first works which performed large-scale evaluation and introduced a systematic metric, right? Before that, many people just has published results on a few images and there we had like this large-scale evaluation. And that was the second test of time award. And then the next one that was awarded, that was work which was done in 2006. So that was with another PhD student and collaborators in the US, UIUC. And that was actually on how to design a spatial, like now we have these local features and how to put a spatial pyramid on top of those to improve the performance significantly. And that showed that by adding spatial context, we could really improve the visual recognition performance significantly. And then the last test of time award was for work which was done in ECC 2008. And that was to now we have all these local features, how to use them for large scale search. There we designed an, an embedding and a spatial consistency constraint to search in very large scale data sets. And we had this very nice demo where we can search the time in millions of in millions and billions of images very effectively. That sounds great. And it sounds like there's the way you explain it also a very natural progression where each each uh, new work built on what was before and looked for the next challenge and um, what's still missing and what can we still achieve um, I was wondering if you can give a little bit of advice on how to search for the next challenge what's the next big research project it sounds from your experience that um, you have good intuitions about finding things to work on that have lasting impact and um, do you have any advice on how advice that you would give to a more junior researcher about how to decide what to work on next yeah i think the advice would be to search for hard problems right just to, to think like what is hard today and not just search for one thing which is easy to do like maybe you think i want to publish a paper and then you do something incremental so that's actually not giving you probably not giving you the test of time in part but to think like what are the hard open problems and then kind of try to solve those maybe also don't rush too much right today a lot of people they just rush from one paper to the other and i mean even i do it right but basically to not rush from one paper to the other but to take some time and really think what are the things you want to achieve and how do you want to achieve them and, and then really work on those do you think that the hard problems are typically problems that a lot of people are trying to solve or are there benefits in trying to find problems that are maybe a bit less areas that are a bit less overcrowded or is that not really a factor in this type of decision making yeah that's actually a very good question and it's like a discussion which comes up over and over again right i mean if you do something where everybody's working on you kind of safer you feel safer to, that you'll have some progress but on the other hand if you pick some problems where, which are not so overcrowded and where you feel you can have some impact maybe you might have more impact right so it's it's kind of trade-off and it's true if you work on something completely uninteresting it might be harder to get some impact but i guess it's it really depends i think you have to really see where you feel you can have the biggest contribution i think so it's, there's no clear answer on this question i think have you thought about um at all how to deal with managing risk when it comes to research or is that not really do you mostly go with what you find interesting and don't really take that into account too much well, I think it's typically a question which comes up if you have PhD students, right? So basically there, I mean, 
you cannot say, oh, let's do a project which you know that in 10 years there will be some output. So you have to have some kind of risk management because you have to see that basically maybe the first year, the first two years you can spend on something very risky, but then if it doesn't turn out, you have to see, say now I have to kind of scale down the expectations and do something where I know it's easy to do and publishable and then kind of like have this, I mean, there, there clearly you have this trade off, right? You don't want somebody not to publish at all and not do their PhD. So you really have to say, now I have to kind of make the decision to go for something it's simpler. And, and they're also like, in some cases, you might be publishing something which otherwise you wouldn't publish because just the person needs it to finish their PhD, right? That is interesting. Um, and it kind of ties into a question that I wanted to ask later, but maybe I'll ask it now since we're kind of on the topic, which relates to um, what the experience is like um, in academia versus industry uh, in terms of the types of research that one does um, of course you you have affiliations with both sides so i think you are in a, in a position to to make the comparison and um i i get the sense that you have a responsibility towards the people you're managing in both scenarios but um if uh, if you're managing phd students how does the research that you focus on differ compared to managing people in in industry yeah i would say i mean basically managing phd students i think it's very unique in a way it's very uniform right because basically in academia you get your grants and you look for interesting problems and you can kind of decide what you're working on and i think in industry it depends much more where precise we are what you want to achieve what the goals are right so i guess it's much more dependent on the projects you're working and like what are the current goals right so basically for example today there's in google research there's a lot of freedom for doing research but other companies they kind of say you have to work on exactly this problem and then you have to kind of execute on this problem so it really depends and and i think currently the differences are that in google there's much more data right i mean personally for me there's much more data and there's much more compute right so that's kind of makes it possible to do larger to attack larger problems in particular like i've been working a lot on video that was something which got really hard in academia right because their data was missing and also the resources were missing and then basically at some point it gets really hard to make significant progress i mean has improved a bit people in academia have been ramping up to get additional resources so they have been efforts to have these centralized clusters and things like that so it has changed a bit but i think currently for me that's the main difference is yeah that, that makes a lot of sense do you think that if um what uh, advice would you give to someone who uh, is deciding between whether they want to go to industry or academia as a as a more junior researcher um i guess there's not one size that fits all but what are some factors that you think would uh, affect that decision yeah, I think it depends how you see your long term goals. And as I said, basically today, there's like many industry labs where you can do very similar types of works, right, that you can have your own career. And I think in, in academia, you can potentially grow a much larger team, even as a junior assistant professor, while in industry, I think it takes more time to grow your own team. So I think maybe if you're more after managing people immediately, I think I would say academia is better. And then if you want to do more your own hands on work, I think industry is better and then obviously there's also the, the factor of salary right i mean a lot of people they're also they want to go to industry because it's better paid right i think that's kind of also an argument which i hear many times and maybe in academia you also have to work harder i think that's kind of also if you want to really achieve something you have to work i mean i'm not saying people in industry don't work hard but i think in academia you have to kind of work harder because you have to manage the students you have to teach you have to get the grant so i think it's it's more more work at least at the at the starting level right and then you also have to build up your career and you get evaluated you have to get your tenure and stuff like that so it's actually harder right that all uh, makes sense um do you think there's a bit of a difference in culture regarding the uh, working or work-life balance in, in the two places? I guess there's a lot of variance because industry depends where exactly. Um, yeah, I think it also depends in, on the individuals, right? I think it's more, I would say the variance is higher between different people than 
between the two, the two, I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have any good measures, but I know people in both places who work a lot and in both places who don't work that much. I mean, so it's like really, it really depends on the individual more than on the, the, the environment, I think. I'm really interested in, in your recent work that leverages multiple modal modalities. Um, so you've worked on constructing high quality data sets from uh, different modalities, um, uh, modifying models like BERT to handle different modalities and, and, and so on. And so I'd like to pick your brain. Do you think, what are your thoughts on why it's important to have these types of cross model um, approaches? And are there new challenges that are associated with figuring out how to leverage multiple modalities efficiently? Yeah, so first of all, I think it's an interesting problem, right, to handle not just one modality, but multiple modalities. And then from, from an understanding side, I mean, you have much more information, right? If you just look at one modality by itself, it's much harder to make sense out of uh, the content right well if you have multiple modalities you can really show that it improves the performance and then if you think of how humans interact with the environment they also they also use the multiple modalities right and so one thing i mean this is like the multiple modalities but then i also think it's interesting to see how people interact with the world right so it's not only multiple modalities but also the interaction with the world which i think is is very interesting so then you really have the full picture of what's happening right and then maybe on a lower level with the bird models, I think that's something which has given a large improvement, right? Before having these multimodal models, it was always hard how to combine modalities. And with this bird style models, it's much more unified to combine the modalities. And I think the next steps is to see how to further improve these multimodal models and to learn even better ways of combining them by having like some idea how the different modalities match and how to join them. And as you mentioned, one thing is obviously very important is the data, right? So basically there's a lot of image text data sets around, but for video text, video multimodal data sets, especially for long, for long interactions and things like that, there's not that much data around. And so that's one of the things also I'm very interested in. That's also something where Google has a lot of data and I guess one of the things we're always trying to do is to make the data also publicly available so that basically other people can also profit from the data. And so do you think that if we had the right data um, and we have, um, we can somehow leverage the interactions with the world and also the different modalities um, that we won't need any explicit supervision? Or do you think that this type of uh, data can replace supervision altogether? Or do you think that um, we still need explicit labels in order to achieve some goals? Well, that's that's a good question. So I think the long term goal would be to, to learn without any labels, but then I guess you need some kind of interaction to correct for biases, right? So I think basically only having the data, probably you're not going to solve all the problems, but probably you can get a far away and then basically having maybe some interactions with with the models you have learned and to improve them. I mean, basically that's kind of where if you could interact with the environment or have some kind of teacher, like some automatic way of teaching the system, then you could improve it online and actively, right? So you don't have to go around and just label all the data, but you could have an interactive way of improving your system. So I guess that would be the final goal. And then obviously if you look at like day-to-day -day tasks, you're getting very far by using the labels, right? So this is like, if you want to solve today a concrete problem, you're probably better off to say, I'll label that much data. I do something where I have like a pre-trained model, I fine tune my model and then I can solve the problem. I guess from a research point, it's interesting to see how far we can get without any label data, right? It's, or like weekly label data, like which is this multimodal data or by interacting with the world. Totally. And then I guess if we did have some label data, like you said, to kind of correct the model in some situations, that would have to be task specific in some way. So we, it, instead of getting a general model that can then be applied to solve any task whatsoever. Yeah, right. Or, or like you could have like a generalist model, which you then adapt to the task, right? depending on what you want to do. And I guess that's something which is also very important is the explainability, right? That you don't just have a model which predicts stuff, but you can also explain why and how what's going on, right? So that you, you kind of understand 
why you're predicting this label for an image. And if you want to kind of remove maybe noisy content, then you can actually say this is not correct. I can use this explainable is explainable fact to remove the data or use some additional knowledge to say this is not what I want. That makes sense. Um, how far do you think we are currently from having models that can explain their predictions in a way that allows for this um, it, to iterate in this way meaningfully? Do we think we have uh, a long way to go still for that? Yeah, I think for now the models are pretty weak, right? I mean, they're kind of very close. The prediction is very close to the explainability, so it's not like completely complementary and we don't have a good idea how to do this in a completely general fashion. So I think for now the approaches, they're quite straightforward and not, and maybe for some context they're pretty easy, but then otherwise in general, I think we don't really know yet how to do this. And I guess it goes also together with understanding, having a more fine-grained understanding of the content, right? Because if you don't really understand, you just predict some label or some caption or something, then it's really hard to make it explainable. While if you have a much finer grasp of the content, the interaction of the objects, the 3D, then it makes it much easier to have some kind of explain explainability as it, in addition to what you're seeing, right? So it kind of together with understanding better the content. Interesting. And um, taking a step back and thinking about the data sets themselves that we use to train these models, um, you've done some work in creating data sets from different modalities. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And in particular, one, um, I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about the following. Um, do we just want larger data sets or to what extent does high quality matter? And does the answer to this question change depending on how we wish to use the models after the fact? Yeah, right. I guess it depends on how you want to use the models, obviously. But I think if you want to have, like, for zero, in particular for zero shot prediction, I mean, there it's really important what kind of data you use to train the model. So, like, our, in our recent paper, I don't know if you're referring to this, like the video CC paper, we really show that by having much better high quality data, we can get much better zero shot prediction. And we did some additional experiments you can really show that depending on what type of data you use, I mean, which kind of makes sense, right? If you feed the model noisy data, it will learn much worse. And then at some point it kind of doesn't learn at all anymore, right? If you have too much noise, it doesn't learn. If it's kind of in between, it still learns some, some predictions. And then if it's really good, then it's much easier to get a good prediction. And I guess one thing, I mean, basically we looked at this multimodal data and one thing which is much harder with multimodal data or vision data is that basically there's much more noise, intrinsic noise, right? Because if you think of text corpuses, there's like, you can look at books and all the books, the, the text is correct, right? So there wouldn't be that high of an amount of noise well. And you can kind of get good data much easier than for videos, right? If you go to YouTube and you just crop and in videos, you don't really know what the content is. Do you have like some labels, but you're not sure if the labels are matching? You can use, for example, we did one work we use the YouTube search engine to get like relatively clean data. This is another data set which we have, and there we can show that the performance is quite good. But there you kind of rely on all the filtering, which is done by YouTube already, like all the Legos method and all that to clean the data. And so then it's better, I guess. If you just scrape random data from the web, it's really very noisy, right? So it's kind of. So I think this is something which is really interesting: is how to make the data better, right? I think, it's like, and it will help a lot, in particular for these multimodal models, right? So. Are there any existing automatic ways of um, cleaning up a data set like that without having to uh, manually? inspect the labels and see if they match the video correctly. Yeah, I guess the, the video CC, what we did there is we kind of took images and captions to mine videos. Then you can see if, like, for example, you have some measures, if the captions measure the video content, you can use some kind of other additional metrics to, to clean up the data, right? So there's a lot of things. And I think one thing I'll I'm interested in this to seeing if like, for example, you can detect objects based on the captions and then see if this is another way of filtering out the data. And then obviously you can also go to other 
other sites where the data is a bit cleaner, so whatever, some video content sites where people actually annotate. And I think that the goal is really to get this idea how to get more data automatically, right? Because you cannot manually annotate all the data. Maybe what you can do is you can use some annotated data as Twitter labels to kickstart the process, right? This is something we're also investigating to see how we can use these pseudo labels to get better data. And I'm also curious when it comes to um, scaling up, um, maybe for moderate sizes of data, it is really important to have as high quality data as possible. But if we were to scale up to train on the entire internet or something larger than that, does the quality still matter? Or in, in that phase, is it less important? No, I think the quality still matters a lot, right? Because if it's too noisy, you just, you cannot learn, right? I mean, think of if you have like label noise, which is larger than 30%, then you just don't learn anything. And so if you just scrape all the data and it's completely noisy, then the system, there's no hope that the system will learn completely automatically, right? And if you think of a human, you also don't just learn random. You don't do random stuff, right? You watch maybe curated content or you have a book, you read from a book. So you also have material where you actually read or in, uh, ingest clean content, right? And so if you just take all the data, which is on the web, which I mean, basically in some cases you can make sure like some of the images and caption data set they're quite clean if you go to Wikipedia. So basically you can actually make some assumptions that the data is clean, right? But then you're really, you're really careful about which data you, you're getting, right? And it's not, it's not about just having any random data. So it's not possible. I mean, basically, for example, if you look at this how to 1 million data set, which has like random instruction videos, you can actually show that even by scaling it up, you get a better pre-training performance, but at some time, some point it saturates. And if you look at zero shot learning, the performance is not that good altogether, right? So there really, you can see that you kind of plateau off at some point. Interesting. Um, that that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, do you think it contradicts to some extent the success obtained by, um, this is not in the world of video, but models like Clip that are just pre-trained to match um, images to their cap to their correct captions, um, which, uh, I mean, those don't require labels, so it's a, a different story maybe, but it seems that they are able to do uh, by just pretty much uncurated data uh, to uh, uh, acquire abilities like few shot learning. Well, I guess they're quite curated, right? All these clip methods, they're quite curated because basically what people do is they kind of make sure that the content of the captions match the images. And I think like if you go to Wikipedia pages, you have, I mean, some of these pages, they have really very clean, even manually cur curated content, right? Because it's people who upload the images and the, and, the, and the videos. And so I guess there, I think, A, I think there's quite, it is quite clean. I think what we have there is quite clean and B, it's not yet reaching supervised performance either, right? So basically the two things, and I think for videos, there's much more noise. And so that's kind of why by maybe leveraging this, these clip models, we can actually kickstart the recognition for videos and then improve the performance, right? So that's kind of, I think. I don't think it's contradictory, right? It's kind of the data is clean and then basically you have to make sure to get the best possible data and then see how you can scale up there. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I wonder how much clip would suffer if, if um, I don't know if somebody ran this experiment. I mean, it's it's only interesting from a research perspective. It's not really practically useful. But if if some noise was introduced to the training data, so some of the um, image and caption pairs were actually not really matching, but we told clip that they are matching and then trained with this slightly noisier data, how much the performance would degrade. I wonder hmm. how robust clip would be to that type of noise. Yeah, I guess you need to do a, a full study, right? To you know how much the noise is hurting you, and then I guess that's if you then that's when you can know how much it hurts. But yeah, I, I don't think we can foresee that. Oh, awesome! Um, a thought experiment like that was done in the aligned paper, apparently. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so from what I've 
remember from reading the aligned paper. It's similar concept to CLIP, uh, but it's a it, it's a, a paper that was written by people here at Google. And uh, the difference, the main difference, I think, versus CLIP is that they they use larger data that's more noisy, uh, like a orders of magnitude larger than the data set that was used for CLIP. Um, and I think the the noisy part is is what the N represents. Maybe uh, I, I'll have to read the paper again, or at least look at it to remember. But I, I thought that's that's the difference. So I, I, yeah, that's all I have. Yeah, thanks. Good good reference. Um, okay, so taking a step further back, then, um, um, or was that the sound of someone? Oh. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I put, I put. Sorry, I put the link to the paper. It says uh, noisy text supervision. So yeah. Thank you. Awesome. So um, taking a step back and um, looking at your research on a high level, uh, Cordelia, it looks like there's a pretty nice thread of evolution throughout. And I'm wondering, is there, um, or rather, what is the North Star that you are hoping this to lead to? Is there a particular goal or task that motivates you? Yeah, I think the North Star would be what I said before, that basically the system can learn by itself, right? And that you kind of achieve the same capacity as a human, maybe even more, but basically the same capacity without any or very little supervision, right? That you can just say, I want to learn from the data and then I obtain, ideally, right? I mean, it's like the North Star, right? That I have the same idea. I can learn about the objects, the relation between objects. I can really understand the visual content, either in 2D, 3D, or what's necessary to interact with the world. And then the next thing would be that also not only can I understand the content, but I can also interact with it, right? That I can just, that I can navigate around a house and I can grasp things and I can manipulate objects. So I think that would be kind of the North Star. And I'm currently also, so at Google, I'm working at video, but at Inra, I'm also working on like robotics applications and visual navigation. So that's kind of, it's still hard, right, to put the two together because it's like two separate works and it's it's hard to combine them. But basically the, the goal would be at, in the long term to be able to combine them and then just navigate around an environment and then by interacting with the environment you can actually learn what's there and by touching and the hope would be by touching and manipulating the objects you can actually learn additional knowledge about the objects and I guess some of the problems if you just have static images are hard to solve I mean if you have videos at least you can segment out objects but basically by interacting with the objects you could learn a better representation better features a better way of just understanding what represents objects. That's quite the North Star. That sounds like an, an amazing goal. But it also sounds like a quite challenging and complex goal because there's all these aspects to it. Learn to represent the world, learn to interact, learn to update your beliefs. It sounds like there's an online component to it as well. How do you think, how can we measure progress towards that goal? How close are we? What are the best ways of um, evaluating success there? Yeah, I think each of the two, uh, each of the problems come with sub goals, right? I mean, you can pretty clearly measure that. I mean, for example, for the interaction, you can measure how how far you get. Like, I mean, it's still really hard, but you can really can really measure what types of interactions you can accomplish. For the understanding, you can see like whatever what types of understanding you have for the video content. So I think you can very clearly structure sub goals, what kind of learning methods. So as you said, one of the things is, is online learning. So how do you formulate things as online learning with reinforcement learning, for example, or combining reinforcement learning with learning from demonstrations, optimal control. So all these things, I think you can pretty clearly make some progress. And I think what you're saying, it's harder, like the end goal is quite hard, right? So it's not clear how to get there today, but you have to kind of solve sub steps immediately, right? So you cannot hope that you'll solve the problem immediately, but you can very well make progress on each of the areas. So that's kind of, and then I guess the question is, then the next question would be how long will it take 
to solve the complete problem and that's kind of unclear right i mean basically sometimes things get make progress quicker and like there's like step forward and then sometimes things plateau off and i guess that's something we have seen i've seen several times in my career we kind of get stuck and nothing works or there's like very little progress and then either you change the method or you change the problem or you work, work on something else but basically i think that's kind of I, anyway that's kind of the north star right and then we'll see how far i mean you can ask me in five years again and then you'll see how far we have gone <laughs> I hope that I get the chance to chat with you again in five years so that I can ask you. <laughs> but for now, um, a follow up question is, um, you know, that makes a lot of sense, breaking it down into um, different milestones. Um, which one of those do you think is the hardest? Which thread of, of these different um, um, directions do you think is the hardest right now or, or the one that you're most excited about? I think the hardest right now is to get some improved visual representation by interactions, right? So that's the thing which I kind of feel very hard that somehow the problem of interacting with the objects is sufficiently different, difficult still before making an improvement to the representation. So that's kind of the thing where I feel like it's very hard, but. Well, I mean, that's kind of the thing where I don't really know how to solve it or how to, what's the solution right now, so. And another thing that I wanted to ask you while we're talking about um, evaluation and assessing how successful we have been towards this goal is, um, I wanted to know what you think about the role of benchmarks. So you mentioned earlier when you were talking about the test of time awards that, um, your paper was the first to do an evaluation, a larger scale evaluation. And, and before that, in that area, people were looking at um, just a few images. Um, what do you think is the role of having more well-defined benchmarks to track progress? Um, are they helpful or do we overfit on them too much? And <laughs> Yeah, I think it was very helpful to have this benchmark. So at the time, like, when I mentioned it, there were basically no benchmarks. And so then several people brought out benchmarks. There was the Pascal, I don't know if you remember that or you're too young, but there was the Pascal UC challenge and things like that. I think it was very important to measure progress. And then I think at some point people started to overfit on the benchmarks, right? So, so it's kind of like, for example, ImageNet, I feel like today it's very overfitted. There are other benchmarks, like kinetics also for video understanding where people completely overfit and it's more about minor things which kind of improve the performance than conceptual changes and I think so there it's kind of important to bring up new benchmarks I'm just seeing in the chat there's this question about the ego 4 d so I think it's important to think of new problems and bring up new benchmarks right to measure measure progress right because you cannot say I made progress if you cannot measure it so you have to have some kind of measure but you probably have to find the, the right benchmark and that's something which is getting harder and har harder right because basically the task getting more and more complex and you have to think more and more about how to set up these benchmarks how to define them well right to have not just like classification labels or simple object detection but like more more complex problems so yeah that makes sense um in the um research area that i've been working on one of the challenges is you want to show that a model can be good at transfer learning or few shot learning or something but so and so you test it on some downstream tasks but it never feels like we have enough of these downstream tasks to really be able to show that you know this model can do transfer learning and mm. it seems that maybe all that we can say is that it can transfer learn to these very specific few data sets but how do i know that it can really transfer learn it feels like we need a very different scale to be able to say this um more broadly do you think there's a similar um trend in, in terms of like how do we benchmark understanding the world from visual representations yeah it's clearly similar and maybe just one comment about i think in google there are many applications where it's really interesting to benchmark on this real applications right so this is maybe one thing so you asked about the differences between academia and industry and i think so there you really have this large scale real applications where you can measure if your approach really improves right so they're basically the benchmarks they're kind of set by the users and you can really evaluate how much improvement you get 
with your model, right? So this is like maybe one thing where you can really say that it's not academic benchmarks, it's not a comparison of all the methods, but you can really see that you can evaluate your methods on a much larger scale. And I guess this is something which is going to be more and more true, for example, for searching within videos and things like this, that it's like really interesting to see how much information we can leverage the users and how good the quality is for this. Yeah, that's such a great point. I guess at the end of the day, everything that we do is aim, aimed at, at the end of the day, solving real problems. So drawing inspiration from um, actual applications to define benchmarks makes a lot of sense. Uh, but on the other hand, benchmarks in academia sometimes are designed to more specifically isolate different aspects or be or designed specifically to answer some research questions. So it seems that the setup is cleaner, but sometimes it's done in such a toy way that the conclusions there don't necessarily transfer to something more uh, realistic. So I guess it's hard to to combine both you want realism but also some benchmarks that can isolate some interesting research questions hopefully. Yeah, but I think it doesn't exclude, the two don't exclude each other, right? I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to be stuck on toy data sets just because you're working in academia. So I think this is something which is also something where Google can play a role to have better benchmarks, right? To think of what would be problems which are interesting to solve and put up benchmarks and then maybe inspire people from academia to move away from toyish problems and work on more real life realistic problems, right? So I think this is something clearly where you can also put effort into it, right? So it's not it's not set in stone that you have to work on uninteresting problems or toyish problems just because you're in academia. So I think it's just that sometimes people get stuck in this like simple benchmarks and then it's a hard, it's very hard to develop data sets also, right? It's kind of something which is very hard and takes a lot of energy and often also not that much appreciated, right? Because it's just people then say it's just it's just a data set paper. So basically you have to also then contribute with the method. So I think it's something maybe where people also should spend more time and like I guess there's some efforts now where people really have put it put in efforts to do this, right? So I guess. Yeah, that's such a good point. We definitely have have had some trouble publishing a benchmark paper before. And I think now NARIPS has a new data sets track, which is really good for encouraging this type of research. Yeah, we had this paper, this Ava paper, where we had like this super great data set and it was so hard to publish it, right? And then basically in the end, we only got it published because we added a method to it, right? So it's like really, and then in, in the end of the day, this makes probably this stops progress also a bit because all these papers, they're really hard to publish and people don't see the contribution of, I mean, obviously you don't want to just publish a data set with no, no interest, but if it's like a new interesting problem, I think it should be actually possible to, to publish it, right? So it's true, NERIPS now has this new benchmark for data sets, but I guess maybe that's kind of a way forward or just put them online and people use it, right? So it's also a possibility. It's quite um, disappointing throughout this conversation. It seems that benchmarks are quite important for making progress. And yet I'm curious why it's, why we are incentivized against writing data set papers. And of, of course, like you said, not just a paper with a data set, but a paper that actually poses some interesting questions um, to drive research in some directions based on a data set. It's not just the data itself. Asking questions sounds to me equally important as having models that try to solve them. Why are we so biased against that? Yeah, I guess people feel like it's somehow not scientific, right? I think that's kind of that. It's kind of just collecting the data is like something which anybody could do. And that's kind of why I think reviewers are kind of biased against. I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's just yeah. an observation, yeah. right? So, yeah. Um, okay, I think um, given that we have roughly 10 minutes left, I'm going to switch to asking questions from the Dory. So if you haven't yet added a question there, now is a great time to do that. Um, I'm going to start from the one that's ranked from the top. Um, maybe you've actually answered this a little bit, but the question says, I really wonder your opinion on recent data set like Ego4D. How do you feel about such egocentric perception problems? 
Yeah, I think it's a great data set and we just started using it. So I don't I don't really have any insights yet on how how difficult, how good it is, but I mean we have kind of started downloading it and they have a lot of annotations, a lot of tasks. So I think it's definitely very interesting. It's very large scale also and, and curated. So it's definitely an interesting data set. Could you say a little bit about it for those who don't know um, about this data? Ah, yeah, that's a good idea. Otko. Thanks for presenting. Yeah, so it's it's an extension, I think, of Epic Kitchens. I mean, I'm, I haven't, I really haven't looked into it a lot, but I think it's an extension of Epic Kitchens where people are manipulating objects. And so there you have tasks of finding the objects, seeing how the people manipulate the objects, how to predict the future predictions of the manipulation. So you see a clip where people mani manipulate the objects and you want to predict what are the next steps. So you can use it, for example, for video prediction, video generation. So. I think and it's I think it's not just kitchens, happy kitchens, just kitchens, and there it's like people gardening, doing all kinds of house, household tasks. So it's a much larger variety of interactions. So happy kitchens, what it is, it's like interacting like cooking videos where you see from an egocentric viewpoint, right? How people are interacting with the objects and then what the what the tasks are are localizing the actions, detecting the actions, forecasting the actions. I think Ego 4D is similar, but again, it's just it just came out, so I haven't like looked it in into detail. Awesome, that sounds interesting. Um, the next question um, is, what do you think are the next challenges that we should address in the context of computer vision? Well, I think there's more than one challenge, right? But I think what we should do is to go more towards object-centric representations and maybe towards more 3D object-centric representations and move away from this full image of video representations where you don't really know where the objects are. At least that's something which I think is important. And then the other thing obviously is towards multimodal models, right? So here, Computer vision is just one modality, but I think there are many cases where having multiple modalities is in interesting. And then again, if you have this multiple modalities, the hope would be also to be able to move towards more object-centric representations. So basically localize the object and the corresponding sound or the words and the text and the corresponding objects. Cool. The next one says, this is more of a management question. Since you started your joint role at Google, how has your day-to-day -day life changed? If you manage other people at Google, how different is it compared to managing PhD students? And are those cross collaborations, and sorry, are there cross collaborations between both of your labs? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so basically it's quite different to manage people at Google because basically they're like full-time employees. So you have to like take care of their career and, make sure that they evolve in their career and do performance evaluation while PhD students, I mean, sure they also have to have their, their goals of fin finishing PhD, but it's kind of more an education goal. And in France, the PhDs are three years. So basically it's a quite short period and you have to kind of make sure that they're doing their PhD. It's kind of different from Google where you, people stay for much longer time, right? So there's like more long-term career evolution. And then are there cross collaborations between your two labs? There, there are some collaborations, but basically the the understanding is that basically the two the two types of works should be completely separate by definition because Google doesn't want like information from academia go to an industry and the other way around as well. So it's like the the my goal is to keep the two as separately as possible. And then obviously sometimes there are collaborations of people doing internships, but I think the line is to keep the two as separate as possible which is maybe a pity right but anyway that's how it is a quick follow-up on that is um how do you um as a manager kind of decide what type of work to do in academia versus industry if the two need to be separate are there some guidelines about that or is it mostly just determined by the interests of the people working in either one of the labs yeah, I think there are some guidelines on how, like some areas of like work which are specified by a contract between INRI and Google. So basically, which specifies which type of work is done where. 
And so then obviously like the sub problems are, are dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. So basically if it's images, videos and multimodal information, then obviously like the sub problems are defined on a day-to-day -day basis by the large works. For example, I don't work at all at, at robotics at Google, right? Well, I work on robotics at INRES, so that's kind of a much larger separation of the two. Right. Um, the next question says, it seems like multimodal data sets are related to supervised learning. For instance, images with captions, that's supervised learning if the researcher adds the labels, but it's multimodal unsupervised learning if the caption image pairs are found on the internet. Yeah, it's completely true. I mean, I would completely agree, right? I mean, if you annotate the captions, then it's supervised, right? Well, if you find them on the internet, then it's weakly supervised. And I guess the, the, the boundaries are kind of like, as I said before, there are many web pages where, for example, ha people have annotated or their videos where people have really put the annotations. For example, on WikiHow, you have annotations for images, videos, and steps. So this is really annotated. You could, you could say that it's weekly supervised, but it's really has been annotated by people, maybe not by researchers, but it has been annotated by people. The same thing, for example, there's this recent web with data set where actually people have annotated it and it's kind of, people say it's scraped from the web, but in the end of the day, it's more, it's closer to supervised labeling because people have annotated it. But anyway, there's kind of some boundaries, right? Some fuzzy boundaries between the two. Yeah, interesting. And this ties in to the discussion we were having earlier about the noise and the annotations, and maybe there's a spectrum and that's somewhere in the middle where you have some. Yeah, right. um, yeah. And even for annotations, right, there's also some noise, right? So that's what we found. For example, if you have to annotate humans and their actions, it's it's very radar dependent. So you have to get very good guidelines to get like a clean annotation. So I think there's like a, a large spectrum of of differences. So. Cool. The next question says, and the last question, in fact, says, can you comment on healthy, successful collaborations with product teams? What are the signs of a successful future collaboration? People, benchmarks, users, and so on. Yeah, I think a healthy, successful collaboration with the product team is to have a clear, defined goal, where then basically you can experiment the methods which you have developed and see how much gain you get, right? And that's also like the successful collaboration would be if you can show on these benchmarks that you get an improvement and then they're relevant for the product teams and they actually adopt they adopt the solution, right? That it's not just you're trying out something on a benchmark and then nobody's interested, but it's like a benchmark which people are interested in and then they're kind of happy and adopt the solution. Do you think so? Okay, so you mentioned before that BERT models allow to easily fuse different modalities, maybe better than approaches that we had before. And I guess transformers in general are pretty widespread these days. Do you think that we still need to make progress on the architecture side? Or do you think that we can basically reuse transformers from now on and just work on getting better data, cleaner data, or more data? Um, and call it a day? No, I think transformers is just like one step on moving towards more powerful models, right? I mean, it kind of makes me think like a couple of years ago, convolutions were the state of the art. Everybody was using convolutions for this and this and this and applying them all over the place and then showing that there was some improvement. I think the same thing is happening now for transformers. I mean, obviously it's a very nice tool for this multimodal fusion. I think it's not the end of the story, right? There's like they're pretty compute in intensive. They don't, they can't model very long interactions. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of limitations. And I think, I don't think, I mean, hopefully we're not stuck with this transformers for the rest of our lives, right? So I think there will be something else. And the first thing is obviously making them more sparse, more, more manageable, extending them maybe to hierarchies, having longer, longer range interactions. If you have, if you deal with images, you want to have better interactions with the different regions of the image. And so I think, no, it's not the end of the story. It's just like one step forward. So. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Cordelia, for your time and for sharing your insights today. We all learn from one another. Research retrospectives are a series of conversations 
that dive into a researcher's technical body of work to understand how papers build on top of each other and create a legacy. We learn about paths not taken, serendipitous events, collaborations, and setbacks that shaped their research. Our interviews are informal, friendly, and fun. And welcome, welcome to, to Retrospectives. Retrospectives.